Well, friends, I'd like to thank you for uh, moving with me through some of the writings of Paul each Sunday morning. Uh, Paul called the Apostle to the Gentiles. Today, I'd like to begin looking at the wonderful letter to the Romans. Uh, It's probably about the next one written by Paul after the Corinthian correspondence and the Thessalonian correspondence and and Galatians. Uh, That's according to some scholars I've come across. And and now this is important because, you know, if you're a new believer, Romans may not be the best place to start your daily Bible reading. Uh, You are reading your Bible daily, right? Actually, I'd suggest maybe looking at one of the Gospels first, if you're a new believer. John is a beautiful Gospel to start with, and then then I go maybe through some of the smaller letters, uh, especially Ephesians, yeah. We know from experience that we grow in our faith by consistently studying the Bible and spending time with Him. You know, God's Word is it's our spiritual food. We can't live without it. As you study his written word, as you read, God will strengthen your faith, speak to your heart, and give you guidance and direction for for every need, for every decision in your life. Like Psalms 119, 105 tells us, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So then I'd probably uh, invite you as that new believer to go on to some of the other Gospels. Uh, first, take a look at Mark, written first, uh, and then Matthew, and then then read through Luke and on into Acts, since uh, they, those two were originally written together. Yeah, we, we need to be mindful of the Old Testament, too. Don't forget that. Don't forget the Old Testament and its teachings. But, uh, but remember that we're also predominantly a New Testament people now. If you get a good grip on the New Testament, then, then maybe you'll be ready to see how we got there by going through the Old. You know, too many folks were just told to open the book, open the Bible, and read it from the very beginning. Friends, no wonder they gave up about the time you get to the book of Numbers. You know, so along the way, I'd suggest that, that you do get to where we are today, and, and that's the letter to the Romans. Now, the letter to the Romans is, is kind of unique. Uh, Paul, the writer, was writing to people he really didn't know. He wanted to know them, but Rome wasn't on his missionary journeys to this point, and it was written about 57, 56 A.D. or C.E., depending on how you like to reference it. Uh, Paul was on his third missionary journey, getting ready to head back toward his home base and toward Jerusalem. He, he was heading to Jerusalem in particular because, well, he had gifts to take to the church from the churches. Yeah, offerings of financial support from other churches to take to the struggling folks in Jerusalem. And, and Paul wrote this letter in order to prepare them, the Romans, for his coming visit, which he expected would be a, a stopping off point for his, his real intention. And actually his real intention, it said, was to, to go on from there to Spain. Spain, you see, was uh, at that time the end of the known world. And Paul's mission was to take the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Paul also wrote it to have a basic plan of salvation available for the church, have that clearly spelled out, and he also wrote it to go over the relationship between the the Jewish world and now the Gentile world together in God's plan of salvation. So you might ask, if, if those were his intentions, well, how did it work out, you know? Is it spelled out, say, as a theme? I mean, why do we study this? I've got my Gospels, right? You say that? You know, that's enough for me. I can even have a taste of Ephesians if you'd like. You know, Romans is so important because, well, anytime there's a kind of of revival in the church, Romans, it's actually right in the middle of it. When there's something happening, Romans is at the center of it. And you say, why, why is that? Because just about every topic that Paul ever writes about in any of his letters is also in this letter to the Romans. About the only thing that's maybe unique to Romans that isn't talked about in some of the other letters is the relationship of the Christian to the to the state. You know how how we how we deal with where we are. How how do we deal with the requirements to obey civil authority, recognizing that God is our ultimate authority? That's the one unique thing probably in Romans. Uh, so looking at the general themes of this awesome letter, there's there is the topic of the righteousness of God along with the universality of the gospel, meaning the good news of Jesus Christ is for everyone. It's universal. And the other big theme is the idea of justification by faith. And that's all wrapped up in God's plan of salvation. So if God is the righteous one, and we're not, but God wants us to become righteous, 
and we do too, then how can that happen? You know, it happens, friends, through that justification by faith part, that plan of salvation. So if Romans has the key to the great plan of salvation, well, what is it? <laughs> Good question. Great place to start, actually. Looking at a key part of the book of Romans, there's this, there's this wonderful group of verses that you may have heard of as the Romans Road. If you want to get somewhere, you know, most of the time around here, we take a road, don't we? Well, the road to salvation is spelled out so well here in this letter to Romans. And here's the landmarks on the Romans road. You might want to write them down as we go through them. Uh, begin with Romans 3.23. Then go to 6.23. Move on to 5.8. Then 10.9. And finally, let's say 10.13. So that's it. 323, 6.23, 5.8, 10.9, 10.13. <laughs> Let's quickly look at each one of them and give you time to write them down as we go along. Uh, Romans 3.23, it tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the start. We've all sinned. Jews, Gentiles, male, female, you, me, we're all sinners. We can't get to God on our own. No matter what system of doing we may try, we won't get to God. We won't achieve eternal salvation. It's, it's not about doing, especially. It's about done. You know, the work of getting from sinner to saved has already been done. It's been done through God in Jesus Christ. God made the plan of salvation, and, and we get the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus the Christ. You may remember last week, we talked about how the law of the Old Testament, you know, it was a great thing in that the law especially pointed out how we really mess up. And that's the law's real purpose. It's, it's to point us to the one who can make things right. The law points us to our sinfulness, and then the law points us to the Savior. We need to be saved from our sins. From the get-go, we decided, along with Adam and Eve, to, to make life all about us, you know, not about God. Uh, the greatest man or woman who ever lived, with the acceptance of Jesus the Christ, well, they sin, you know. We can't live in this fallen world without sin and sinning. Even if we were capable of not sinning, well, you know, the world just poisons us. It won't keep us from sin. It's just there. So, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we admit that, well, you know, a lot of the battle is already won, friends. So then we can move on to Romans 6.23. Three chapters later, in 6.23, we discover that the wages of sin is death. We sin, and what's the penalty for sin? Death. We get what we deserve when we choose sin. We get death. Now you say, no one gets out of this life alive anyway, so then they'd be right. But the death we're especially talking about here is that, that second death that the Bible teaches. It's, it's eternal separation from the love of God for eternity. Uh, the death of love in our lives. Uh, the love God wants us to experience with God for eternity. Choose sin, you choose eternal death. Choose life, you choose eternal love. So the wages, uh, what we earn when we choose sin over God, it's death. And then there's the big, big word of the Bible, the, the word, but. Sure, the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a beautiful contrast right there, you know. Choose sin, death. Choose God's gift of Jesus Christ, life. I know for too many folks, it's, it just sounds too simple. But the best things in life are pretty simple, aren't they? So we know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A and what we earn by sinning, the wages of sin, is death. And then the hope begins. But, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's move on to Romans 5.8. It says again that, that word but, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It, it isn't something we did. It isn't something we can do. It's done. We're what's called justified through faith in what God has done in Jesus Christ. God sent us his one and only son, Jesus, a sinless one. 
And in doing that, God demonstrated his love for us. And that was clearly seen when Christ Jesus died for us all. And then let's move on to 10.9. So we admit we're sinners. We see that what we've really earned as a sinner is death. And then those two big buts come in, you know, but the gift of God is life. And that's that's what's been given to us through God the Son. Now, now what's it make us ready for? I believe all that. Okay, you say, you say, I, I don't do it myself. God's already done it. Okay, but by now, isn't there something I should be doing? Well, yeah, I guess you're right. But it's not about should. It's more about what I get to do now. I get to tell the good news. I get to confess and I get to believe. Believe in something a whole lot bigger than me. Romans 10.9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Like that silly, uh, what is he? The world's greatest salesman, he's called, that commercial about auto insurance, he would say, done, done deal. Confess, believe, done deal. Well, friends, you know, the earliest confession back in Paul's day was, was probably used at baptisms. It was about claiming Jesus as Lord of your life. Lord, Yahweh, uh, the name given by the Old Testament people of Israel called, called God Yahweh. Uh, so when you claim Jesus as your Yahweh, as your Lord, Lord of your life, he's just that. When you lift up the name of Jesus without shame, saying, he's my Lord, he is that. And the bedrock truth of Christians is that Jesus was not only Lord, he is still Lord. He's alive. He still lives. So for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. That's the last stop for the moment on this road called the Romans Road. It's 1013. Jesus isn't just for the preacher or the teacher. He's Lord for you and the Lord for everyone. Black, brown, yellow, man, woman, child. He's Lord of all and Lord for all. Friends, God in Jesus Christ has done something for us that, that we can't do for ourselves. If you trust God and God's word, God has said it's taken care of. Even though you'll still sin. Yeah, we'll still sin because that's, well, just doggone it the way we are. We'll still sin, but that that won't throw us all the way back to go on our monopoly board of life, you know? No, if you trust God, trust the love of God, nothing is going to ever separate you from that perfect love of God. We're not under the power of sin that we once were. But again, there's that but. But God in Jesus Christ, he's taken our sins away. He's what's called the expiation for our sins. Uh, the perfect sinless sacrifice of forgiveness for our sins. It's like using that whiteout now, you know? Now we can claim eternal life with assurance that the love of God just blankets all that ugliness of sin and covers us with his purity throughout eternity. Well, friends, after you've uh, walked down through this Romans road with me and maybe you've been on your knees and said, Lord, I just give it all to you. I invite you to prayerfully get up and then walk through those passages again and and then maybe spend some more time throughout the book of Romans, maybe especially chapter 8. You know, it's it's so important to us chapter 8. If you were if you were ever in a situation where you could where you could only have one chapter of the entire Bible with you, if say if you're going to the prison, solitary confinement for the rest of your life, choose Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. And when you're in that prison, no matter if it's a physical prison or a, or a prison of your soul or mind, know this, friends. Romans 8, 18. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And I invite you to claim 828. And we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called 
according to his purpose.